ولكن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I really don't like sitting down when I speak. I believe uh, it drains a person's energy and they're unable to convey the message effectively when they do so. So I want to start off talking to you about a portion of time. And that is four seconds. What does four seconds actually mean to you as an individual? Four seconds is the amount of time that every individual has before they make an assessment of another person. In this four seconds, you are ready to decide, will I be willing to listen what you have to say, or will I be, you know, politically correct and nice and kind and listen to you, but inside I don't really want to listen to you. That is approximately how long every individual has. Now the reason why I mention this is this has a direct relationship to one's character. The way one's character is will define, will another person listen to us or not. Now one of the beautiful things about Islam is that when a, Mus a person becomes a practicing Muslim, they become someone who wants to dedicate themselves to this religion. One of the very first things they do is educate themselves about this religion. Now, like the Shaykh was speaking before, there are certain things that are fundamental to this religion. And one of the most fundamental things about this religion of Islam is our character. If we were to go back in history, go back to around the year 240 in the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. We come to a great scholar by the name of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah ta'ala. The scholars mention that there were approximately 5,000 people that used to attend his gatherings. When he would give a lecture, approximately 5,000 people in Baghdad would attend his gatherings. Now from those 5,000 people, only 500 of them would be writing down. Meaning they would be writing down what he would say. And the rest of them were just looking at his character and learning from the way that he conducted himself. And this is something truly amazing because these were not young children that were sitting at his feet. But these were the future scholars of Islam. They wanted to see how this great individual, this great person conducted himself so that similarly they could conduct themselves in that way. And then you look, where did this tradition start from? That we start about learning about akhlaq. It came from the Prophet ﷺ himself. And the famous hadith of Jibreel. When Jibreel came to see the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, where he came in these beautiful white garments, and he had this nice black hair, and you could not see any remnants of travel on him. He came and he sat by the Messenger of Allah وسلم, politely, putting his knees by his knees and asking him questions. The Prophet وسلم, concluded this hadith by saying, this angel, he came to you to teach you your religion. And one of the very first things that we learn from this hadith is that the way a person dresses, is that when he goes out in public, he should be wearing presentable clothes. He shouldn't come out, you know, in the clothes that he slept in. Unfortunately, like a, a lot of the brothers have a habit of doing. I know in my local masjid that, you know, when I give a lecture, I can tell, you know, brothers who literally just woke up fresh for Salatul Fajr, and they came to the masjid, they were wearing like their track pants, and you know, like these ripped t-shirts. And I was like, you know, just take five more minutes, get ready, and you know, be presentable. So all of these things, they make a big difference in our lives. And that is what I want to talk about with you today. The importance of akhlaq. The importance of akhlaq. So let's start off by discussing what are some of the virtues of akhlaq. So I'm going to give two virtues myself, and then I want to open up the floor to you guys. So you guys can give me some feedback. What are the virtues of akhlaq? One of the first virtues of having good character was the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used to make dua, O oh Allah, perfect my character just like you have perfected my creation. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fashioned us in a particular way. 
And just like He fashioned us perfectly, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to perfect our characters as well. So this is one of the first virtues of good character, was that this was something the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa himself used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. A second virtue of good character, it was the advice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to his companions. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, he told Mu'adh three things. He told Mu'adh three things. The first thing he mentioned was to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever he is. Fear Allah wherever you are. Number two was follow a bad deed with a good deed so that it may wipe it out. And the third thing he mentioned and treat people nicely. وَخَالِكِ nas bi husn al That treat the people nicely. So this was the advice of a companion that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not going to see again. His farewell advice was summarized in these three lines. And the last of them being, treat people nicely. Have good character with them. So I want to take a moment here to hear from you. What are some of the other virtues of good character? It can be something related to the deen, it can be something related to the dunya. What are some of the virtues of good character? Who's going to raise their hand and you know, start off the discussion? Go for it. Intentions. Okay, how so? Well, your intentions will lead on to your actions. If you have bad intentions, you have bad actions. Okay. Good starting point. Who else? What are some of the virtues of good character? This may be a manifestation of why a lot of the Muslims have bad akhlaq. This may be. I'm not saying we do, but I'm saying it may be. What are some of the other virtues? Think about it. When a person is good, what do they get? Or what is the benefit of being good? Go for it. Excellent. Good point. So birds of a feather flock together. And the point being that a person who has good akhlaq and good character will attract such people as well. I mean, very rarely will you find this person who has like amazing akhlaq and he's surrounded by terrible people. Because the time eventually comes, either he becomes a bad person or they become good people. But it doesn't work that one person is good in the group and everyone else is bad. So good point, you will attract like people. What else? What are some of the other virtues? People. That is a virtue, but what is the virtue of being patient? Of being patient, like why would you be patient? Go ahead. For example, if you're patient, then you're more, um, more likely to have good judgment. As in, say if something happened, then you take time and reflect, and then make an assessment rather than just spitting out the best thing that came to your mind. Okay, so good character brings about good outcomes. Right? Good character brings about good outcomes. And I will generalize this statement even further, is that you will see one of the greatest aspects of leadership, and what makes a leader good, is the way he conducts himself with other people. And that is why you will see, of, the, of all of the descriptions, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, could have been given in the Qur'an. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe him? He describes him as وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That O oh, you Messenger of Allah are indeed of an exalted standard of character. And this was a characteristic that stuck out. And this ties us into another virtue. That it was the methodology, the way of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that he would be well-mannered with people. Now let's just get one more and then I'll give you some more for myself inshaAllah. Because you guys don't seem too talkative today. Well, let's just get one more person, inshallah. For the sake of Allah, go ahead. Excellent. I was actually going to conclude my talk with that. So you just took my conclusion away. But good character is good dawah. So I'll give you my conclusion right now, but I won't conclude. I was actually on an airplane when um, the attacks in Norway happened. I was on the airplane when the attacks in Norway happened. And I was watching the news live as all of it was happening. And one of the very first reports they gave was Muslims strike again. You know, terrorism attacks happen in Norway. 
And I was like, subhanAllah, you know, this is so crazy. Because it's like every other month, some crazy Muslim is doing something. And now the sad thing was, I fell to the propaganda of the media. You know, as a Muslim myself, I fell for it. You know, time goes on, we later come to see that it had nothing to do with Islam, had nothing to do with Muslims. In fact, it was someone that hated Islam and the Muslims and he was responsible for it. But one important lesson that it taught me was that as Muslims, we do have a bullseye on us. That people are out to target the Muslims. The media is out there to do that. And now there needs to be a counter reaction to this. One of the typical counter reactions to this is that we will go in front of embassies, we'll burn down their flags, we'll cause riots, we'll do all sorts of other things. But there's a more practical and a more effective way, and that is just practicing your religion. Practicing the very fundamentals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught you. To be kind, to, be forg to forgive, to be tolerant towards people. Another important virtue that good character brings about is that it is the way people will treat you. A lot of the people think that this is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, but rather it was just a saying of our predecessors. They used to say, كَمَا تَدِينُ tudan. The way that you treat people is the way that you yourself will be treated. And I'm sure you, all of you have felt this in your life. That when you are generous and kind towards people, you will see that they reciprocate this generosity and kindness towards you. And at times when you are arrogant and stuck up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a person who is arrogant and stuck up to you as well. So when you are well-mannered, people will be well-mannered towards you. And when you are ill-mannered, people will be ill-mannered towards you as well. Another benefit and virtue of good character is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Paradise. The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Paradise. There's a set of verses in Surah Al-Imran, the third chapter of the Qur'an, which are some of the most beautiful verses that you may ever come across. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this, these uh, verses during one of the battles. During one of the battles. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down these verses, there was a companion who had dates in his hand. He had dates in his hand, just three of them. And he looked at these dates and he said, if I live long enough to finish eating these dates, I would have lived too long of a life. He threw the dates behind him and he went onto the battlefield and he died. Now these verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed were the following. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ عِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالدَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظَ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in these beautiful verses, and hasten towards the forgiveness of your Lord and a paradise. A paradise whose expanse is the size of the heavens and the earth prepared for people who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who give when times are prosperous, and those who give when times are adverse. And those who forgive people, and pardon them, and control their anger. And indeed Allah loves all of people who do ihsan, who do righteousness towards other people. So from the virtues of good akhlaq is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared a paradise for those people who practice good character. And it is from the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone, He will give them good character. And likewise, one of the ways of receiving the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having good character as well. So now let's talk about what are some of the virtuous characteristics we need to have as Muslims? Some of the virtuous characteristics that we need to have as Muslims. Going back to these very set of verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions something very, very particular. 
which I believe we have become negligent of. And that is being tolerant with people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ nas That those people who are pardoning and being, are tolerant towards people. And when I look back in history, I found two amazing examples of this. One of them was from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa himself. That if you look back at the opening of Mecca, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa went back to Mecca to recapture it, look at the series of events that happened at this time. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa not only was he himself persecuted, not only were his companions persecuted, but likewise, they were exiled from their very hometown. From Mecca, they were exiled. They were told to leave and to get out of here. And now, as the Muslim community grew, they got stronger. They're coming back to take this sacred land known as Mecca. And as the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and his companions, they came in, in helmets, they came in, in armor and with artillery. They entered Mecca in a state of humbleness and humility. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he mentions that as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Mecca, he was on his horse and his head was bowed down. And as the people were watching this, you have 10,000 Muslims coming into Mecca all at one time, they're starting to wonder what is going to happen with us. You know, the people that we persecuted, the people that we killed, are they going to seek the revenge today? So as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is coming in, they start asking, you are the noble, the son of the noble, what are you going to do with us? A person they one used to, once used to call a madman, they once used to call a destroyer of homes, they once called a soothsayer and a magician, they're now calling him the noble, the son of the noble. My, what fear does to people. Time continues, he finally gets to the Kaaba, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gets down from his horse. And he sees that the people are petrified. And here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is in a state of strength, not in a state of weakness. If he wanted to slaughter and kill, he could have done it. But he tells the people at that time, I say to you, just like Yusuf alayhi salam said to his brothers, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم that no blame and no reproach be upon you today. May Allah forgive you. For indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful of all those that show mercy. Pardoning people. Now I want you to think about that. Now I want you to think about a time, perhaps you were in the tube, perhaps you were on the bus. Someone accidentally shoulder bumped you. How did you react to that? You know, a lot of the times we turn around and, you know, the very least we do is we give them this evil stare. Like, what's your problem? You know, you want to take this outside? That's what we're thinking. And that's just something as small as an accidental shoulder bump. Now, how would you react to someone who persecutes you, kicks you out of your house? Do you think you'd be able to forgive them? Would you be able to pardon them? That's what true character is about. How you react in those times of tribulation. So now, if you're reacting like that with a shoulder bump, I want you to think about what you would possibly do in that state. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. A second example that I find was the example of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, one of the great Imams of Islam, he was known to be a debater. He liked to discuss issues. And if you read, if you read some of his discussions, you know, he was like a, a cutthroat type person that you don't mess with him because he tears you apart. Now, one of the individuals, when Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah passed away, he gave a eulogy, he gave a description of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. He said, Imam al-Shafi'i and I, rahimahullah, we differed in many, many issues. And there was a time where I would get up and leave out of a state of anger. I would get up and leave out of a state of anger. And I would not speak to him for a few days because of how angry I used to get. And after a couple of days would go by, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, he used to come to my house, and he used to say, that just because we differ on a few issues, it does not mean that we cannot have united hearts. 
And to me, this is the essence of unity. You know, a lot of times, scholars and speakers, they speak about this concept of unity. Unity is not conformity of the mind. Unity does not mean we will all agree in the way that we think, in the way that we speak, in the, way, in the thoughts that we have. But true unity is unity of the hearts. That intellectually you have the ability to differ, but you realize that Allah has created a bond bigger than our thoughts, bigger than anything we could ever create. And that is the bond of brotherhood. So one of the first things you need to introduce into ourselves, or we need to introduce into ourselves, is this concept of tolerance, this concept of pardoning, the concept of forgiveness for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A second characteristic sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he was generous like the wind. He was generous like the wind. Now what does that term actually mean? I want you guys to think about that and let's see who the zaki or the intelligent person is amongst us. When someone is generous like the wind, what does that actually mean? How is that a praiseworthy description of the Messenger of Allah? Go for it. Excellent. So very quick, when the wind comes, it comes very quickly. It doesn't take a long time for it to come. So when it's time to be generous, the Messenger of Allah was very generous. But there's something more to it than just that. What else? Never ending. Is the wind continuous here in London? <laughs> I mean, it stops and goes on. But I mean, I see where you're coming from, that in the greater scheme of things, the wind is always going to be there. So generosity of the Messenger of Allah is never ending in that aspect. Anyone else? The wind brings the clouds, which brings rain. The wind brings the clouds, which brings the rain. So how do you tie that in with the Messenger of Allah? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's we're fasting, it's okay, you're excused inshallah. Go for it. Um, it's indiscriminate, so it touches everybody. Excellent, that's what I was looking for. It does not discriminate against people. You know, when we think of charity, when we give our zakat, it's like, okay, we're going to send our charity and our zakat back home. Or we're only going to give it to like the poor people of one community. But the charity and the generosity of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, it knew no boundaries. Anyone that came for anything asking the Messenger of Allah, he would give it to them. And this is a very important point and factor over here, is when we talk about good character, what does it actually mean? Good character can be summarized in one sentence. It is to be in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the night, and it is to be in the service of the people during the day. This is the definition of good character. And that is why when you see when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, described his message, he said, Inni bu'ithtu makarim al That indeed I was sent as a messenger from Allah to perfect morality, to perfect good conduct. And this is good conduct with Allah and good conduct with the people. And that is why you will see his secret to success was the very fact that he used to worship Allah during the nights for a prolonged period of time. And during the day, he was always in the service of the people, always willing to help them out. So the generosity of the Messenger of Allah, it knew no limits. Just like the wind. The wind benefits the young and the old, the poor and the rich, the black and the white, you know, the good looking, the not so good looking, all of them. So that is what the generosity of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was. And this is important particularly in this month. Because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, He commanded us, He commanded us, that save yourselves from the hellfire, even if it is with half of a date. Meaning half of a date can save you from the persecution and punishment of the hellfire. If you give it with a noble intention of feeding a poor person, someone who does not have food, even a half of a date can protect you from the hellfire. So then how about if you give something greater? I want to go back into the hijrah that the companions made from Mecca to Medina. When the companions made hijrah from Mecca to Medina, the first thing the Messenger of Allah وسلم, did was that he paired them up. He took one of the Muhajirun and he paired them with one of the Ansar. Took one of the companions from Mecca 
and took one of the companions from Medina and he said, you guys are now brothers. And there's this beautiful story of how one of the companions from Mecca, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, was paired with one of the companions of Medina, Sa'd ibn Rabi'a radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he's introduced to Sa'd ibn Rabi'a. He's told by the Messenger of Allah, you guys are now brothers. These people have never met before. They know nothing about each other. They have no idea what this relationship is going to be like. But I want you to see the reaction of Sa'd ibn Rabi'a towards Abdurrahman ibn Auf. He tells Abdurrahman ibn Auf that I have two houses, one of them is yours. I have two businesses. Take anyone that pleases you. Now think for a second. This is someone that you've never met, you know nothing about. You have no idea what they're going to do to your property, no idea what they're going to do to your business. Would you really trust them with this? Now if you look at the economic state of Medina at that time as well, it becomes very important. Medina was not very cultured at that time. Meaning it wasn't very strong in business. And the lights are dimming. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and then there was light again. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> are we good to go? Okay. So Abdurrahman ibn Awf and Sa'd ibn Rabia. Some people that have never met before. Some people that have never met before. And he says, look, take half of them, take, I have two houses, take one of them, I have two businesses, take one of them. So this is generosity uh, from the side of Sa'd ibn Rabia. He's showing this act of generosity, this act of courtesy to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And this is something tremendous within of itself. I mean, literally speaking, I came from Canada, you know, you may or may not know anything about me. If I ask you for your house and I ask you for one of your businesses, are you going to give it to me? <laughs> You're honest about it at least, alhamdulillah. You're honest about it. And that's the reality of it. That we're no longer willing to give, no longer willing to sacrifice. But for the, the, the point or the uh, operative you know, mode in, in this story is the way that Abdurrahman ibn Auf reacted. He didn't say, okay, you know what? Give me the bigger of the two houses and give me the better of the two businesses. He says, Jazakallahu khair, just show me where the marketplace is. Let me do business for myself. I will fend for myself. So he goes to the marketplace and the story continues. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he left his family behind. And he does business for a couple of days. And then one day, he meets the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam again. And he has these yellow stains on, uh, on a white garment. How many people know what haldi is? Haldi. You know, uh, what's it called in English? Does anyone remember? Tamarack powder. powder. Excellent. So, sorry? Isn't that what I said? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not tamarind, no. Tamarack. Yes. So he has these stains on his clothes. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asks him, Ya Abdurrahman, what are these stains on your clothes? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I got married. <laughs> now I want you to think about this for a second. You know, what was Abdurrahman doing that would cause him to have these yellow stains on his, on his white garment? This is like an interesting point of fiqh that you learn. That the companions of Allah, they knew how to party. <laughs> Honest to God. Like he was partying, he was celebrating his walima, and that's how it got on him. You know, in our own customs, in our own uh, backgrounds, we have different ways of celebrating our weddings. And you know, even till this day, they use the, this tamarack powder, and predominantly now it's uh, for the women. But back then, they used to throw it on the bride as well. So Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he tells the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that I got married. The Messenger of Allah, he asks him, Ya Abdurrahman, you know, what did you give her as a dowry? What did you give her as a wedding present? And he mentions that he gave her a, a small nugget of gold. And this is such an amazing story because Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he came into Medina with absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So how did Abdurrahman ibn Awf 
get married with a nugget of gold. And the story we learned to find out is that he was given food that day, which was dried yogurt. He took that dried yogurt, went to the market, and sold it for fresh butter. He gets this fresh butter, divides it into two, he now sells that fresh butter, and that is how he got that coin of gold. And this is the, the effect of having tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not being greedy towards the wealth of others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless your wealth for you. So learn to give, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you much, much, much more. And you will actually be content. The third and last point I want to mention, in terms of things that we need to change in ourselves, is being concerned with our own selves. We live in a culture and in a time where there is this gross infatuation with what other people are doing. So right now, someone may be on their very phone, they're checking Twitter updates. You know, one of their friends is in the bathroom reading a book. And for some reason that's interesting in our lives. I mean, it's true. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen status updates. You know, I just arrived home. <laughs> now, you know, what do you want me to do with that? <laughs> but we have this gross infatuation where we are over-concerned with the lives of others. But you see, this goes against the prophetic methodology. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us, مِنْ حُسْنِ الْإِسْلَامِ الْمَرْئِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِي That from the best of one's Islam, one of the best things that you can do as a Muslim is just be concerned with your own self. Do not be concerned with the business of others. Now how does this actually benefit you? This means that when you're walking on the street, you're not looking around at every Tom, Dick and Harry. You're not looking around at what this world has to offer. But rather, you're always looking at yourself. And you'll see this brings about many, many benefits. From the benefits of this is that if you're a person who's busy with himself, this will naturally help you lower your gaze. Then when a person is thinking about themselves, where does their gaze usually go as they're walking? It's usually down. Right? So that naturally helps you lower your gaze. It helps you not look at the opposite gender. Another benefit of being concerned with your own self is that it prevents talking about other individuals. And when you can reduce the amount of conversation you have about other individuals, this is one of the ways that you will learn to save yourselves from the hellfire. That the Messenger of Allah وسلم, told us that there will be a group of people that they will say something about another individual that they will think is insignificant and minute. But in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is so great that it will cause them to be thrown into the hellfire. And then we have the example of a woman that was with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And she described another woman from the Ansar. Not by something she said, but she just went like this. Meaning that she was a very short individual. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam told her that you have done something, you have said something that is so evil and so vice, it would turn the waters, the oceans in this world black. That's how evil it was. So another benefit of being concerned with yourself is that you reduce the amount of sins that your tongue commits. That you'll only be talking about yourself, obviously, you know, not praising and glorifying yourself, but in a way that you don't speak about others. And I actually want you to think about this for a second. Next time you're having a conversation with your friend, I didn't mean right now. <laughs> Next time you're having a conversation with your friend, see how much of your conversation is actually about other people. And you'll see the vast majority of our conversations are usually about other people. Hey, did you see Fatima's hijab at the event? Wasn't it so nice? Or did you see the thobe the brother was wearing and how it wasn't ironed? You know? <laughs> no, no offense to anyone that's wearing a thobe. But it's like the vast majority of our conversations, that's what it's about. It's about other people. So it will reduce the amount of sins that we commit. And a third benefit in being concerned with yourself is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the ranks of people through this. Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, from the people of Medina, 
There were people who I used to hold in very high esteem. And I used to always wonder that what was it that caused their status to be elevated to such a degree that people considered them noble, they treated them well, they treated them nice. And then I noticed that as time went on, they lost this elevation, this, I guess, aura that they used to have. And I found out what's changed at that time was that they started to concern themselves with the affairs of other people. That before they started to concern themselves with the affairs of other people, they used to be noble in the sight of Imam Malik rahimahullah. But once they started to, to dwell into the affairs of others, they fell in that rank, they fell in that status. So a person who is always concerned with himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate his status for him. So now, those are three important characteristics that I believe we need to change. Self-reflection, being concerned with yourself. Being generous and being pardoning and forgiving. These are three things that you can leave with today. Make it your goal to change this within yourself. To be more generous, to be more pardoning and forgiving, and to be a person who's only concerned with their own affairs. Because there will come a time where you will stand in front of Allah. It's not going to be this room, it's not going to be every Muslim, but you alone as an individual will stand in front of Allah, you will stand in front of God Himself. And you will be asked about the deeds that you committed. And if you're unable to answer the, on that day, what are you going to do? Hope for Allah's pardon and forgiveness? Allah's pardoning and forgiving. But how much will you seek that pardoning and forgiving? So don't put yourself in that situation where you're going to be in a state of regret that day. Prevent that state from coming. And this leads us into our topic of discussion. What are things that we can do as Muslims, as individuals, that can have us have or make us have better akhlaq and better character? And I want to summarize this into two points, bithnillahi ta'ala. The first point is having an interactive theology an interactive creed, an interactive understanding of faith. I remember as a young boy, we were taught the um, six kalimas. Did anyone learn the six kalimas as a young child? Anyone go to a Saturday or Sunday school? No, not too many people. <laughs> so we were taught the six kalimas. And literally, we were given this sheet of paper, and we were just told to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it in Arabic. We had no idea what it meant. And eventually I went to Medina, I learned Arabic, and I'm like, oh, that's what that word meant. Oh, this is what it means. And it became like an enlightening moment for me. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, only if I was taught what these words actually mean as a young child, perhaps I would have been a better child. <laughs> but those words, and what I want to share with you, are the pillars of Iman. You know, we are told that Iman consists of six things. It is to believe in Allah, to believe in the angels, to believe in the books, to believe in the prophets, to believe in the last day, and to believe in predestiny, the good and the bad of it. These are the arkan of Iman. And I'm sure that every one of us in this room knows what these terms are and they know what they mean. But what ends up happening is, it remains very theoretical. It's not something that we interact with on a daily basis. It's not something that's ingrained in our minds that we need to be conscious of. And I believe this will be the catalyst in changing one's character truly. That if a person understands what these six pillars of Iman truly are, this is what will help change your character. The first of them, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does this instill inside of you? When I mention the term Allah, does this move you and shake you on the inside? More than likely it doesn't. But let me help you with that. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one day in the marketplace. And the companions are around the Messenger of Allah. And they see this woman running around from side to side in the marketplace. And each time she would pass by a young child, she would pick up that child and embrace it. 
and tears would come out of her eyes and then she would let it go and this continued several times until she found the child that she herself had lost and she embraced this child and she held this child and those tears of anguish and despair they now turn into tears of joy the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he turns to his companions and he says do you see this woman do you think that she would ever throw her child into the fire do you think she would ever throw her child into the fire they said, Kalla ya Rasulullah. That ya Rasulullah, she would never do that. She would not be able to do so. That's how much love a mother has for its child. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says something so profound. He says, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more compassionate, more merciful, and more loving towards his slaves than this woman is towards her child. And that is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we are those disobedient, those ill-mannered children. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to forgive us, will continue to love us, no matter what our state is. Then you move on to the angels. How does this affect your personality? How does this affect your mind? The brother mentioned the example of clouds, and I'm going to tie it in right now. You know, clouds truly are an amazing thing. I was once in a city known as Edmonton. It's the most northern major city in all of Canada. And I was about to deliver a course there, and two weeks before I was about to deliver that course, they sent me a newspaper clipping. That newspaper clipping said, Edmonton, second coldest city in the world, minus 53 degrees. So I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, you know, how am I going to travel to the city and survive? And that's coming from someone who lives at like minus 35. Montreal is at like minus 35 sometimes. So I thought minus 53, that's crazy, that's insanity. But when I actually got to Edmonton, that is when I truly saw insanity. I saw madness. I could not believe what I was seeing. It got so cold, the pipes that run underground, that carry our water, they froze. So you could not go to the bathroom because you couldn't flush it. You want to make wudu, it's like drops of ice are coming down and it's freezing. That's what's happening. So I asked them, you know, how do you people get water when this happens? Then they said, you know, why don't we show you? So they took me to the town center and there's like a, a building called City Hall there. And people would carry big water containers, like these 20 liter jugs that you know they carry in the offices, where you press the blue button, you get cold water, you press the red button, you get hot water. Those big containers. They would take those containers, fill them up with 20, 30 liters. Then they would suffer in carrying them back to the car. And then you'd see some old people, that not, they didn't have cars, they would have to walk on the street. And as they're walking on the street, they're climbing up these buildings that are three, four, five stories high. No elevators. They're climbing up the stairs. And I thought, subhanAllah, how difficult it is just to carry 20 or 30 liters of water. But let's tie that into the angels. The angels transport millions, if not billions, liters of water. How? Through the clouds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created water in such a way that it evaporates, it goes into the clouds. He wants to grant that sustenance to someone in London, He brings this cloud from Scotland, sends it to London, and the rain comes down with the help of the angels. And thus you see the effect that angels have in our lives. They are the angels of Allah, they, these, these people or this creation that bring glad tidings. Think about an instance that perhaps you were walking down some steps and somehow or another you managed to slip but you retained your balance. Or think about maybe a time where you were driving and you weren't paying attention on the road yet somehow or another you were diverted from having a major catastrophe and a major accident. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent an angel to help you. 
Just like he sent the angels in the battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى That you were not the one who were casting the stones, it was the angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent. And thus the angels are there to protect the believers. So they are there to help and to preserve and to protect. But what else are the angels there for? They're there to write down each and every single thing that we say. مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ that an individual does not speak a single word, except that an angel is there to write down what it says. So now when you can understand this concept that each and every word that you utter, an angel is writing it down and is going to present it to Allah. Do you want an angel to show curse words to Allah that you spoke? Do you want the angels to show, you know, uh, immoral things that you used to say in this world? Obviously not. So it helps you control your tongue as well. Then let's move on to the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment. Does it inspire hope or does it inspire fear? And I believe in the vast majority of people it probably inspires fear. But it's also a moment of hope and let's see why. It's a moment of fear firstly because that is the day we will be held accountable for everything that we did, for everything that we said, for the way that we treated people. And it is a scary place to be, because we know we have done injustices in this world. We have done things we would not tell other people, and we are not proud to show to others. Yet on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose it to you. He will tell you what you did, and will ask you why you did it. And that is something to be very afraid of. And that is why thoughts of the Day of Judgment should prevent you from doing injustices towards others. But how does the Day of Judgment bring hope? The Day of Judgment also inspires hope into a person. That anything that you lost, anything that someone took away from you unjustly, you will be compensated in full on the Day of Judgment. So someone stole something from you, someone said something bad about you, you're angry and upset. But in this world, learn to forgive it. Because on the Day of Judgment, that is when you will truly get your compensation. So it inspires hope in an individual as well. That you know, we're not as doomed as we thought as we might be. Because just like we dealt injustices, injustices were done to us as well. And perhaps we did a few less injustices and we received a few more injustices that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us and enter us into paradise. Then think about destiny. You know, this is related to that very concept. That when you look at life as a whole, you'll see destiny is a beautiful thing. Because you realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. He sustains you. He knows what's best for you. And He will only allow to happen that which is best for you. Whether you realize it right now, right now or not. That when you die, you will see that Allah had this greater plan for you in life. And everything falls in its place. And a person who understands destiny will always be content. The world could be falling apart, but he knows that Allah is ultimately in control. And he's not going to do any injustices towards his creation. So he's content with that matter. Then you look at the messengers. What does belief in the messengers entail? Belief in the messengers brings about looking at their conduct. How Yusuf salam was with his brothers. How Ayyub salam dealt with his trials. How Isa salam was with his people. All of these prophets and messengers, they had this noble character. And it teaches and inspires us to be exactly like them. So you see my brothers and sisters that when you take something as simple, just as the pillars of faith that we all know, and you learn to interact with them, you become conscious of them in your daily life. It is a first step in reformation. It is a first step in refining our character. And the last point I want to conclude with, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, that will help us change our character, is a dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You'll see that life and change are very difficult things. To change habits, to change friends, to change your environment are very difficult things. 
And shaitan will not want you to change for the better. Now someone as great as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to say the following dua so frequently that a young eight-year-old boy learnt it. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. He says, I learned the following dua from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam due to how frequently he used to repeat it. Due to how frequently he used to repeat it. He used to say, Allahumma, inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Al-hammi wal-hazan. Wal-ajzi wal-kasal. Wal-bukhli wal-jubun. Wa-dala'a al-dayni wa ghalbat al-rijal. Eight things. I want you to notice what these eight things are. The first of them, Al-Hammi wal-Huzun. Al-Ham is to be worried about the future. So he's saying, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from being worried about the future. Wal-Huzun, it is to grieve over the past. And I seek refuge in you from grieving over the past. Wal-Ajzi wal-Kasal. Ajz is to have incapability, meaning to not be capable of doing something. That all I seek refuge in you from not being capable of doing things. Wal kasal, and I seek refuge in you from being lazy. Al ajzi wal kasal. Wal bukhli wal jubun. Al bukhul, to be stingy, someone who withholds, not only with his money, but with his time and with his effort. So I seek refuge in being someone who withholds and is miserly. And jubun is to be a coward. He used to seek refuge in being a coward. وَالضَّلَعَ الدَّيْنِ وَغَلْبَةَ الرِّجَالِ ضَلَعَ الدَّيْنِ is to be overpowered by debt. And غَلْبَةَ الرِّجَالِ is to be overpowered by men. Now I'm going to repeat these eight things one more time. And I want you to tell me what is the theme that ties all of these eight things together. الْحَمْ وَالْحُزُنْ it is to be worried about the future and to grieve over the past. Wal ajzi wal kasal. It is to be incapable of doing something and to be lazy. Wal bukhli wal jubun. To be stingy, to be miserly, and to be a coward. And then to be overpowered by debt and to be overpowered by people. How do these eight things tie together? What is it that unifies these eight things? Can anybody tell me? Go for it. Excellent, but what, how is it related to yourself? You can control it. You can control it? You don't have to let these things overcome you. Possibly. Our brother over here that had his hand up. It's all part of your character. Maybe. That might be it. But I'm looking for something greater. And I'll give you a clue, I'll give you a hint. How does shaitan use these things against you? Go ahead. Okay, that's part of it. It prevents you from being dependent upon Allah. And what else? Almost, go ahead. It builds anxiety. The first part of the dua is definitely about that. Excellent. It prevents you from taking action. It prevents you from doing things. It prevents you from change. All of these things will prevent you from taking action. That in the first two, you're either busy thinking about what may happen in the future, or you're grieving over what happened in the past. Aj is incapability, that you don't have the ability to do it. Al-Kasal is to be lazy. And then Al-Bukhal is to be stingy with your time. Wal Jubun is to be a coward, that you're not ready to face the people. Wadala ad-dayn is to be overpowered by debt. Then when people are in debt, they're just, just in the state of being in a whirlpool of negative thoughts, and then being overpowered by men. That sometimes people will overpower you, and you're unable to stand up for change. And the Messenger of Allah wasallam, he became productive, he brought his actions about through making dua to Allah. That, O oh Allah, protect me from all of these things. I seek refuge in you from all of these things. Now I want to tie all of this back in. That the point of the lectures you're hearing today 
is not for the sake of being entertained, it's not for the sake of finding something to do before you break your fast. But the point of these lectures is to bring about change in your life, to change the character that you have, to change the individual that you are. Because you came into this month of Ramadan with a message from Allah. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَكُونَ That you were sent fasting, you were sent this month of Ramadan in hopes that once this month of Ramadan comes to an end, you are people of taqwa, people who are conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is not befitting that you leave Ramadan just as you entered this beautiful month. Some sort of change has to take place. And this is what I want to conclude with. That you as an individual are a walking ambassador for Islam. That it is no longer befitting that a Muslim has evil or ill moral ikhlaq. That he cannot be, you know, a degenerate individual. But he is someone who is refined in his character. Someone who brings about positive change. Someone who teaches people what true Islam is all about. Being in the service of the people during the day and being in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the night. The key to success that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had. Now I want to summarize my whole lecture bi ta'ala for you in two minutes bi ta'ala. We started off discussing some of the virtues and benefits of good character. We said it was a dua that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to make that Allah refined his character just as he refined his physical appearance. We said that it was the advice the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave to Mu'adh ibn Jabal as he went to Yemen to treat the people in kindness. We said that from the virtues of good character is that you will be surrounded by people with good character. And likewise, people will deal with you in good character. So those are some of the virtues. Then we talked about three aspects of character that we want to change within ourselves. The first of them being that we be people who are generous. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with so much. In this blessed month, you want to learn to be generous. The second thing, is that you be pardoning and forgiving. And then the third of them being, is that we be people who restrict ourselves to our own selves. Meaning not constantly being concerned with the affairs of other people and looking at other people. And then I concluded my lecture with two things. How do we go about bringing this change? Understanding the pillars of Iman and the effect that it has on your personality and your adab and akhlaq as a Muslim. And the second thing, the dua the Prophet sallallahu used to make so frequently that an eight-year-old boy was able to learn it. And that being, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajzi wal-kasal wal-bukhli wal-jubun wal-dala'a al-dayni wa ghalbat al-rijal. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us people of taqwa at the end of this month and makes us better Muslims than we were before we came into this month and makes us people who have this beautiful akhlaq and can be true ambassadors of this beautiful religion of Islam and makes us people who are forgiven through this month wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh